let me just review a little bit. I just like to do this in my style to kind of review the, the last few lectures so that you remember the high points. So one of the first things, the first day was all about scalability, and we ended up talking about weak scaling, and you have to have a model in which to do weak scaling. For multigrid, it's appropriate to, to do something where uh, things relate linearly, and so that's the definition of weak scaling. We used that to look at a multigrid example, and that was kind of the, the main point of that first day. And the second day, I started off saying, now, wait a minute. It may not all be about computing. Sometimes you just want to go to talk to people or go to the library, or you want to pick different models, and modeling differently can often have a bigger impact than, than uh, using the right computational techniques. Then we looked at some notation for computer architecture, processor memory switch, and I've challenged you to, when you're looking at uh, GPUs or, or multi-core architectures or anything, look at it from the perspective of that notation. And okay, so that was a lot of pretty pictures, which is always fun, and I, then I, this is where I introduced the, the work of Andrew Chen on um, the 10 by 10 architecture. Uh, and I remind you that his idea is that as we get uh, more and more dark silicon on our chips, as they get bigger and you can't turn everything on at once, that you might have a situation where a single chip has multiple functionality. I added the FPGA we talked a lot about, and he said you could have up to 10 of these, and, and that was his, his suggestion. So um, then I talked about data dependencies and loop carried dependencies. And then started looking at Gauss elimination. So Gauss elimination has that neat looking um, iteration space. It's a triply nested loop. And there are, uh, there's a, a double loop here. That's the core computation. So this is the, as you march into the board, um, you, you go a number of steps equal to the dimension of the, the matrix. And you get a smaller and smaller square of, of, of numbers that you're working on. And we applied our, our theory of dependence analysis and said, well, there are no loop carried dependencies in this whole square. Now, when that happens, that means that you can do this inner loop in any order you want. And there are lots of orders possible. It's a combinatorial number of orders. So you could imagine any kind of algorithm, and that could keep us busy for eternity. Um, and I will look at one simple algorithm just to get a sense of what's going on. I re reviewed very quickly what Gauss elimination does. It's a matrix factorization. The factors are important, and actually one of them is uh, comes from these numbers you generate, uh, and the other one comes from what's left uh, once you've reduced this to a triangular form. Um, and we talked about the properties of the, of the algorithm, and particularly the most important thing is the, the loop carry dependencies. And I hope that you studied why it is you can prove there are no loop carry dependencies. That's probably the most important example, is to make sure you can see why there are no loop carry dependencies in that innermost algorithm. And it's a little bit unusual, because it, it's not immediately obvious. It comes from the, the, a condition that only you would know. A, a compiler uh, might not be able to figure that out on its own. Okay. So here's how you can parallelize that uh, one way. And it's called the column-oriented uh, approach. So every column in the matrix is assigned to a different processor, typically in a cyclic order to, to promote load balancing. And the way it goes is the following. You're, you're looping over this outer index k. So if you happen to own the current column, the kth column, you compute these multipliers and then you broadcast them to everybody else. Otherwise, you just wait and receive those numbers, and once you get them, you go do Gauss elimination. But you just do it on the columns that you own. You don't try to do it on the, somebody else's columns. And that's what divides it up into P parts, and, and that's the, uh, the, the column-oriented parallelization of Gauss elimination. There's also a row-oriented one that you can imagine, uh, and, and many other variants of that. So, What's the complexity of it? Well, uh, we can estimate the time execution as follows. So for each value of k, we have to do a certain number of divisions. And these multipliers are then broadcast to other processors. 
So that gives us, uh, gives us something proportional to the number of multipliers. So n minus k is the number of multipliers. And this C1 uh, somehow subsumes both the divisions and the cost of, of broadcasting it. And then once we're done with that, the other processors um, do an amount of work proportional to n minus k squared, except that gets divided by p because everybody uh, participates in that. And so C2 is a constant that, that uh, estimates how much it costs to do a multiply add pair. Um, and so we can now sum that up over all the values of k, and we get an expression like this. Uh, so this was the divisions and the communication, and this is the rest of the computation. And so the speed up, Remember how to compute the speed up? We take this and we divide it uh, by the to divide it into the, the sequential time, which is proportional to n cubed, and we get an expression like this, which is going to be p times this complicated expression, and that of course tells us what the efficiency is. So, what do we think? Is this a scalable algorithm? Who wants to answer that question? Yes or no? That's always a good idea. Okay, notice his technique. He didn't think, he looked at the last line of the slide. Always a good idea. <laughs> okay, just joking, just joking. Um, so yes, it's scalable if what? If we take, we remember to do scalability, you have to say what is P as a function of N? So we're taking P equal to a constant times N. If we do that, then we get a constant efficiency here. So that's scalable. We don't have to do that. We could take some other function and then start to reason. Remember, the scalability definition doesn't say you have to get constant efficiency. It's just got to be bounded below. It could dip down a little bit and go back up and do whatever it wants. It just can't ever go to zero. Okay, so yes, this is scalable. And we're taking a number of processors equal to the number of, of n. So that's good. That's uh, simple to remember. Okay, now it does a little bit more than that. It happened that, that uh, expression we had said that we should get the same efficiency as long as the ratio p over n is constant. And here are some data that, that show that. So I, what I've done here is gone from 16 processors, 64 processors, and doubled the size, and um, that's doubled the, uh, the uh, given us, um, did I do that correctly? Let's just make sure I did that correctly. Uh, I've got four times as many processors and Hmm, I think I should have had the square around here, right, according to that, because I've made n four times larger. Okay, my, my apologies, the, the box is in the wrong place. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, I, so, Can I see that your mic has a green light on top, flashing? Yes. Good. Good, good, good. Okay, good. So I am alive. This is just, this is a heart monitor that's checking to see if I'm still alive. Um, okay, well, I apologize for having the box in the wrong place. but. Um, and I should also apologize, this is very old data, but I love it. It's like an old friend, or it's like an old hat. I just can't throw it away. This is uh, one of the early Intel IPSCs. But it does allow me to emphasize one point, is that this is a solved problem. We, we've known how to do this for many, many years. And so we need to move on to harder uh, problems. Let me just say one thing about memory scalability, though, because that was one important thing we talked about. Is this scalable with respect to memory? Unfortunately not, because if we take um, P proportional to N, then we're going to have the memory growing with N. And so it's not scalable with respect to memory according our, to our definition. If we were to try to make it scalable with respect to memory, the efficiency would go to zero. That is, if we took P proportional to n squared processors, it wouldn't, wouldn't work. Having said that, from a practical point of view, this thing is, is very scalable in the sense that e even with fixed memory sizes, because the, it, with the number of processors proportional to n, the time of execution is order n squared. So for example, take a reasonable number of n and p, 100 million processors. Looks pretty good to me. You mean that's too small, or? Good, good point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
two. Yes. Okay. So let's look at that. So what happens if we put if we put p equal to n squared here? Okay. So p is now n squared. So the efficiency is one over something that grows with n. So in fact, if p is any any power of n greater than one, then the efficiency will go to zero. Good. Good. Good question. Okay. All right. So back to this question. Professor Keyes has wrote. <laughs> because we know people do this. Well, I, okay, so a little war story here. Why not? So many years ago, when Intel started building its big machines, somebody did a calculation with the dense matrix. I didn't believe in dense matrix calculations, but they actually did one. It was so large, you couldn't fit it in memory. They actually used tape. They were writing stuff in and out using tape. And it was a, a, a huge calculation that was, they said, uh, designed to get the cross section of uh, the radar cross section of certain aircraft. So I don't know. Um, I, I would, I try every once in a while to figure out are people doing really large, dense problems? So this is sort of a made up problem. Let, let's understand it. But at least what, what it says is that if you go through the numbers, so I said, you know, take about a gigabyte per processor, uh, processors release a gigaflops processor. Um, this is going to be a one month long calculation and it's going to fit on your, your machine. So, you know, this is not really, it, to say it's not scalable with respect to memory is not really, pra from a practical point of view, it's going to be too long a calculation. The time is going to constrain you more than space on this. So that's the, I mean, these, you know, you have to take these definitions like memory scalability with a grain of salt. They just, they tell you something, but they don't really, you know, they don't constrain you necessarily. Okay, well, let's move on to what you might think is a simpler problem. So solving a triangular system is very easy. That's why you do Gauss elimination. You get this triangular system, and, you know, the first equation just says this unknown is this divided by this entry, and you work your way down the triangular matrix. Um, but um, the reason Gauss elimination was so scalable is that the work to memory ratio is order n. So it's as the size gets bigger, the work to memory ratio keeps getting bigger. What about for triangular solve? It's order one. So this is going to be hard. Um, so um, the, in addition, there are all these loop carry dependencies in the algorithm. So let's just let's look at the algorithm for um, back substitution. And to make it a little bit more realistic, I've now made it for a banded matrix. So um, that's even the harder case. So the, we'll see that solving a triangular uh, system for a full, full triangular matrix is easier than one where there's a, a much smaller bandwidth. Okay, so this is the algorithm. And when you do the analysis, the, the dependence analysis, loop carry dependence analysis, you'll see that there are are essential dependencies in here. It's not simple to get rid of them. So there's no way to just sort of wave your hands and make it go away. Okay, so what do we do? Um, well, first of all, let me just say that there are many different scenarios where triangular solves could be important. Um, it could come up just one time when you're doing Gauss elimination. In that case, it is the smaller part of the computation. Maybe you don't need to worry about it. The, the computation is really dominated by the factorization. So if you parallelize that well, you may not need to worry about the triangular solve. Um, it could come up in scenarios where you've got to solve with a fixed triangular equation with many right-hand sides, in which case you can afford to do some preprocessing. I'll talk about that. Um, and um, the key point is that the work to memory ratio is small, and so it's not got a lot of inherent parallelism. So I'm going to take kind of a straw algorithm here that um, I made up out of whole cloth. I call it the toy duck algorithm. And it's because this is the picture that depicts the algorithm. So processor zero is going to do some work related to this part of the band. This is a banded triangular matrix. This is the main diagonal of the matrix. These are all zeros over here. These are the only non-zeros. And I've just 
taken a particular part of the band and drawn this little pictograph around it. And so it looks like a toy duck, because you've got the zero up where the eye should be. Um, what I'm going to do is divide up the work as indicated here. So processor one will do work related to this part of the matrix, and processor two will do work and so forth on down to P minus one, and processor zero will be working on stuff related to the head. Okay, so I've got to explain that to you, but that's going to be a, a, a pictorial represent, representation of the algorithm. Um, it's very similar to something I just skipped over. Let me go back to that. I'm sorry, I skipped over this. So I, it's because it's one of the exercises. So here's another exercise for you. I, there are two algorithms here that are described. One of them is called the standard Gauss elimination. That's what I looked at. There's another one called overlap Gauss elimination. And overlap Gauss elimination is, is very simple to describe. Here's this part that one of the processors is going to do. It's essentially a sequential part in Gauss elimination. If you own a particular column, you're going to compute these multipliers and then broadcast it. OK, so the challenge is figure out a way to interleave that computation with the rest of the computation. So the idea is when you're down here doing this part of the computation, what you want to do is say, ah, I'm the processor that's going to be doing the next multipliers. As soon as I've done the work I need to to update a particular row, um, I can go do these computations and broadcast it and then go back doing the rest of my work. And that gives you an improved performance as indicated here. Notice the jump in efficiency by using that overlap Gauss elimination. And your exercise is to either you know, figure it out on your own or, or go look at my book, which will be faster. Um, OK, so what I claim here is this toy duck algorithm that's very similar to that idea. We just figure out what can I do in advance that I would be doing anyway? What, what can I have one processor do sort of in advance while other people are doing productive work? And it comes down to this. So the pro one processor is going to do some computation here that corresponds to the unknowns, which would match up if you had the unknowns in an, an array here. The ones that are over here, it would be solving for. So processor zero is going to solve for those unknowns. There is an amount of work that can be done before you know what these unknowns are. That's here. So the rest of the processors are going to do this computation. These, this isn't, you see there's some missing stuff here, which I can't do until I have those unknowns, and this processor is busy providing them. But it's going to do that, and it's going to send me, and then I'll keep going. OK, so, so this is what everybody else is going to do. And processor zero is going to do this computation. Let's look at what that looks like in a little bit more detail. Uh, I'm going to make some assumptions about how things are divided up. There is a parameter k, which I've assumed is the size of this granularity here. So both. Uh, the, the, the number of rows in both groups is the same. It's k. And I've assumed that k is a multiple, an integer multiple of p minus 1 to make everything work out. So um, let's go back to see if k, this is k, it's an integer multiple of p minus 1, say equal to p minus 1, then that means that each one of these little strips here is exactly that parameter nu. So I've just made it for simplicity that each row or each parent row here is actually new rows, a fixed number, I mean, an integer number of rows. OK. Um, and what is going to happen is that these processors that I, this, the computation I described here involves the x's that have been previously computed. So it's going to compute some partial results, which are called bi, using previously computed xj's. So here are the b's, and here are the, the x's. And you just have to trust me that they are in, that, in, in, uh, in this picture. The computations involving, involved here do not involve x's that I haven't done yet. So, um, so that's what 
everybody else does. Meanwhile, processor zero is looking ahead and computing the new values of x's using the old values of bi's, which it got from the other processors at some previous communication step, and is ready to send it. Okay, now at the communication step is processor zero sends those values to other processors, and other processors send their b's to processor zero. So these are kind of interesting. So this is a broadcast by processor zero, and this is a many-to-one uh, exchange. Okay, so that's the ELTH step, and another exercise for you is to figure out how you start it and how you end it, but it's relatively simple to do. Um, so um, each one of those steps has exactly k squared multiply add pairs, and um, we can figure out how to make it load balanced in a number of ways. So let's take the case nu equal to 2. Nu is this parameter here. So we're saying essentially every processor has two rows to work with. And then um, what we can do is to get load balance, we need to somehow have some sort of interleaving of things. And so we have processor 1 doing the first and last row, processor doing and so forth. And that will uh, make the, the triangular nature, the, the trapezoidal nature of this ameliorated. So it's not exactly like to get load balance. I didn't, it's not like this. Processor 1 does this row and this row. Processor 2 does this row and this row and so forth. But you can make that load balance. Um, then the um, number of operations to do 1360. 1360 is this computation. That's the Bs is this amount. And uh, so the time estimate is this. And processor zero does a different kind of computation. It's got a different shape to it. So you would expect to see something that's a little bit stranger. Um, and so the total computation is the max of these two things. So they're balanced if by chance this number is equal to this number, which reduces to having some explicit formula for the number of processors. So we do get a, a balanced computation with this choice of P, and it works out that then P satisfies this relationship. Now notice there's no N here. This is the bandwidth. Nu is this parameter we picked, say nu equal to 2, would give us a load balance. Um, and this is saying that P is roughly the square root of the bandwidth. That's not normally what we think of for a, a scalable algorithm, but what it says is if we've got a big bandwidth, then we have a good algorithm that could scale up to square root of the, of the uh, bandwidth number of processors. Okay, um, let's just think about the scalability in a little bit more detail. Um, if we had a situation where the bandwidth goes to infinity as n goes to infinity, then it really is scalable. So I leave that as an exercise for you to, to, to convince yourself of. In particular, the full matrix case is the bandwidth is equal to n, so it's a good algorithm for that. Um, Okay, so, um, and there's information on the, the amount of memory here, which I'll just skip over. Let me go on to a different algorithm. There are two reasons for it. I'm going into a lot of detail here, but um, I, I want to point out that there are different algorithms, and I have a very interesting proof that these, remember, we're, these are two different algorithms for solving a very simple problem. I guess we've also got the sequential algorithm for solving a, a system of equations, and we've reordered it to get one parallel algorithm. We're going to do something completely different to get a third algorithm. And we'll see why we can tell it's a different algorithm. It's kind of interesting to, to think about. How do you prove that two algorithms are different? You'll see why in a minute. Okay, so I, I call this a block inverse algorithm. I'm not really sure what other people call it. I didn't invent it. It's in, in the references. So I'm going to write my triangular banded system in this way. So I just choose um, a, a subdivision of it into k blocks, and then I um, make it so that um, the, the choice of um, k 
better be here somewhere so that the, the this incorporates the entire band structure. Let's see where that assumption is. Da, 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 da. I seem to have, I don't see it right here. Anyway, but the point is we're supposed to choose K in such a way so that this, um, we can write it in this way so that this is a, um, uh, that the band, that there are no non-zeros left over here. So all the non-zeros are included. Okay, so how do I deal with this? Well, I'm just going to simply multiply by a block diagonal matrix where um, the diagonal block of D is the inverse of the original Li. So I'm just going to take the inverses of these, form a diagonal matrix, and multiply. Um, that's a very parallel operation. That's, that can be done uh, uh, trivially in parallel. Um, and of course, we'll have to figure out how expensive that was. We'll analyze that in a minute, but that's what the algorithm is. So now I get something of this form. And um, the Gs I determine by solving this equation. So that's, again, trivially parallel to do. Um, and I convert the right-hand sides from Fs to Bs, again, according to this. So I've got a lot of trivial parallelism to convert to this form. And we'll see we don't need all of that. We, there's a, um, a simplification or, or, or a specification of, of how much of that we need. So in particular, these Gs, let's just remember where the Gs come from. I start with these Rs, and then the Rs are the right-hand side in this equation. This is an equation for a, a this is a, a bunch of equations, if you will. This is solving for, this is a matrix, and so this is a matrix. And I get this GI. And then I'm going to notice that a bunch of the, the first columns of that are 0. That's because of the bandwidth. And so I'm going to focus on the, what's re left. So that's this G hat. And I'm going to further subdivide G hat by talking about the top rows of it here. So W is the bandwidth. Let's remind ourselves, what is S here? So S is S is n divided by k. I've assumed that n is divisible by k here. So that's what S is. So I've got, I claim here, um, this subdivided in such a way that the first S minus W columns are 0. And I can then focus on the rest of it. And then I let m be the top of that and H be the bottom of that. OK, and then I correspondingly split the right-hand side in such a way. Here's what you end up with at the end. So you end up with um, this GI hat divided in this way. The solution vector and the right-hand side are divided in a similar way. And these are the dimensions of these component matrices. So H's are square, and the M's are not square, potentially. Well, OK, so it's not immediately obvious, but what this does is reduce to the following system of equations. So you have a simple recursion relation involving the H's for the Z's. And you have another recursion relation for the, the Y's. So the, I should have that picture on here. But um, the Y's and the Z's are the components of the solution. So now. We've got these two simple relations. Um, I guess I should ask, just to get everybody to wake up again, are, are there any dependence relations here? Or is this, just, is this trivially parallel to compute? Or um, So far, everything I've said is trivially parallel. I've just put a bunch of indices on things. So now, have I somehow reduced this linear problem into a totally trivially parallel problem? Or is, is there a dependence here? Can I, can I have P processors compute this computation? No, because it says ZI plus 1 is something involving ZI. So this is really just another linear system. But the key point is it's much smaller than what we started with. And then this one, once we have the ZIs, this is trivially parallel. OK, so all the dependences have been worked into here. H, remember, is this bandwidth by bandwidth square matrix. OK, so we've done a big reduction 
on the computation. And now we can go to work um, trying to estimate how much work is involved in this. So we count as before. Um, we look at the component parts. So 1372 is this computation. That was pretty simple. That was a trivially parallel computation. It's there. 1376, whoops, was this computation. There it is. And 1377, which is this trivially parallel computation, is purported to be this big mass. So let's just assume that I've gotten this correct here. These are the, the three main components of the work. This is the one that's not trivially parallel here. OK. So when we put all that together, um, we end up with twice as much work as in the sequential case. But we can assess how much the, the, what the, ter the uh, parallel execution time would be. Um, so if this is done sequentially, this, which we said is sequential, if we just do it sequentially, then this is what we get. Um, and if we take p equal to k, we end up with this expression for the efficiency. So we get a, 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 an efficient algorithm if we take the number of processors on the order of n divided by the bandwidth. Okay. So this is why I know this is a different algorithm, because I've got a different dependence of the, the scaling on the bandwidth in n. Before I had something which scaled well, well, the scaling law was p squared is equal to the bandwidth. Here I'm saying p is um, n divided by the bandwidth. So now I've got two algorithms. I've got one which is good if the bandwidth is big, independent of the size of n. And here I've got one that is good if n over the bandwidth is big. So if the bandwidth is small. But wait, I got more algorithms for you. There, it's an, I mean, I don't know how many algorithms. There's probably an infinite number. But in, in our book, we cover a couple more where you get even different scaling laws. So there's a remarkable set of, of ways to solve this problem with different dependencies on the problem size and the bandwidth. Um, and um, so one could pick and choose. And, and I, you know, I'm going to get a question. Yes, go ahead. Without P, though, isn't this not going to be memory scalable? Like, if I have a fixed bandwidth, then my memory is going to go like through N, and I run through the roof eventually with N, right? Yeah, I mean, there, I, I haven't really talked about the scalability with respect to memory. Again, I would argue we, we need to be careful about that, because we might find that it's theoretically not scalable with respect to memory, but you know, for the foreseeable future, it's fine. Okay. Um, yes? Then with this fix, then you have only you know, an amount of memory that's proportional in itself to one amount. Right. So that's, that's actually, that overcomes the fixed attention. Right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, we can, there, there's more to look at here. I just wanted to get, you know, for the, the first cut through this, I wanted you to see that there are two different algorithms that had, have two completely different behaviors with respect to the bandwidth. And uh, in their own regimes are quite scalable in the sense that I, I don't mean, you know, scalable in the true sense, but the, that the efficiency is a, a, a reasonable size number. You know, we can, we can make this be, um, something fixed uh, bounded away from zero. Okay, um, that is great. Um, I, it looks like I'm making up a huge amount of time here. I don't think anybody's going to mind that. Uh, uh, let me just say a little bit about where we're going to go with this and uh, give you a caveat. Uh, I, eventually, people are going to ask me, well, what about some computational experience with this? Because when I'm, when I'm, where I'm going after this is I want to talk about the problem of solving ordinary differential equations in parallel, parallel in time. Now, just like with a linear, just 
solving a, a triangular system, which you think of as essentially sequential, it may be surprising that you can solve an ordinary differential equation, which is evolving one step at a time, in parallel, where you parallelize over time. But we've seen that it's possible in the linear case, and what I'm going to argue is, well, in the case of an ODE, if you discretize it, in some cases you end up with a linear system. If you have a linear ordinary differential equation, you'll get a linear system. And so you can apply exactly these methods. And so then I want to go on and say, well, what do you do in the case that the system is nonlinear? Can you somehow use these ideas? Um, and I'll argue that Newton's method provides a very nice paradigm for attacking that. Um, and then, as I say, people are going to say, well, what about some computational experience? Well, one thing I would point out, with all of these different algorithms for solving linear systems, I am not aware of any sort of comprehensive comparison of how these algorithms perform on different machines. And I'm certain that in addition to the things that we can see just analytically, the difference uh, in scalability, there are going to be significant dif differences in how these are implemented or, or, uh, or the, Im the impact of the implementation and impact of the different differences in architecture. Um, and uh, so if you're looking for something to do, I would suggest this as a, a rather interesting project to compare some of these different methods for solving both linear systems and then ultimately looking at, at solving ODEs in parallel in time. Um, and uh, I guess with that, I'll see if we've got any more questions. We'll leave the rest for next time. Right. So let me, let me just make sure everybody knows what Matt is saying here. So, uh, so sparse means, in, this is a sparse, ban, a banded matrix is a sparse matrix, but, but in general you could have sparse matrices that are not banded in any simple way, or, or you can't figure out how to reorder them in a way that they look, that banded is the right way to think about them. There are too many interesting zeros inside the band is maybe a way to say it. Um, so I'm talking about the simple case here. What about the general sparse case? Good luck. I mean, I, I think this is uh, uh, maybe a properly neglected subject area. It's probably difficult to, to get good code for it, but there, there would be a big payoff for it. Um, yeah, yeah. No, this is, this is a serious area. There, a lot of attention has been paid to elimination techniques and not enough to the triangular solve. And um, it's hard because the, the work to memory ratio is, is small. And um, I don't know, in many applications, it, you don't care because it's hidden behind the, the factorization. So there are lots of reasons to avoid this problem. But there are a lot of good reasons to tackle problems that are inherently hard. I agree with the, the last speaker. I meant to open up with this comment. The last speaker was saying, oh, sorry about this, but performance programming is hard. Well, look, if it weren't hard, they wouldn't pay us all this money, right? <laughs> so you want to do hard things. The harder the problems are you, that you work on, then the longer persistence it's likely to have. Of course, if you solve it very quickly, that's also good. But, um, so I'm proposing some hard problems here. Um, and uh, next time I'll, I'll propose some that I think are even harder and, and more open-ended. So what I've talked about here has been in the literature for a very long time, uh, although I would say somewhat neglected from a practical point of view. And the really hard part, as, as Matt points out, is this truly general sparse case. And, and as, I mean, I don't even know quite how the theory would look in that case. So that would, that's something else that needs to be done. But. We'll talk about the ODE case next time, so thanks very much.